Previously, we watched as Xanders and his LMB slowly began to lose hold of the bank due to the streets outside becoming more and more hostile. They were losing men, and due to hardware complications, the backup of the servers was still a long way from completion. After confirmation from Bliss, the LMB broke their contract and withdrew from the bank, falling back to regroup with another unit of nearby LMB. Over the other side, Agents Shu and Hoskins are hot on Johanna's trail. Following a number of clues, they've managed to locate a building that has the potential to be a large cleaner facility that is responsible for the manufacture of countless firebombs that have been making their way onto the streets. With division agents on their way to her location, Johanna contacts Xanders for assistance. She knows she will need help defending a huge stockpile of firebombs. They have been hard at work putting all of these together for a large op that Pharaoh has them preparing for. The plan? They're going to blow up the Hudson refugee camp and everyone inside it. They know that these camps are the number one source of spreading the virus. All these people in close proximity to one another, spreading the disease and free to come and go as they please. By doing so, they continue to ignorantly help the virus in reaching more and more vulnerable and healthy individuals outside their walls. Unfortunately, a lot of Xander's men are still recovering from the conflicts of when they were defending the bank headquarters. And on top of this, Xander's still had to brief Bliss on his current situation and everything that has happened since they last spoke, which means that there is no way possible he can get to her location in time. He suggests that she and her cleaners move themselves closer to his position. Johanna agrees, and with the assistance of her crew, they manage to locate a building in close proximity to where Xanders and his men are located. The Empire Autumn Hotel. Staying out of sight on a rooftop near to the location, Hoskins and Shu contact Amsel, asking her to provide them with some additional support with their raid on the cleaners. She tells them she will head to their location with some backup. However, she explains that with such a large group of JTF, they will take some time to get ready. Waiting at the rendezvous point, Hoskins is growing more and more impatient. And much to Shu's objection, she suggests that they get closer so they can scan the building with a pulse, just to make sure the cleaners haven't disembarked already. Immediately they notice that a number of personnel inside are removing equipment from the building. Worried they may miss their opportunity, Hoskins demands that they strike the building immediately. They quickly make a plan. Shu will go through the office and disable the bomb detonators with a shock grenade, and Hoskins will go to the roof and provide cover through the skylight, where she should have a good vantage point. Shu sneaks in and gets into position. He waits for the perfect opportunity and lobs a grenade into the middle of the explosives. Before the grenade has even hit the ground, he has ducked into cover and is setting up a turret. The remaining cleaners have now turned their attention towards him and have opened fire. Unfortunately, he has jumped the gun and Hoskins has not yet made it to the roof, so he's on his own. And even more unfortunately, the vantage point that she was making her way to already has someone else up there and they are firing down upon him. As he prepares to fall back to the safety of outside, his exit is suddenly blocked as the roller door slams down behind him. It was a trap. Hearing his calls for help, Hoskins frantically moves away onto the roof. And there she comes across a similar face, Johanna. And she is the one that is firing down on Shu. Raising her gun immediately onto her shoulder, she commands Johanna put down her weapon and step away from the skylight. She keeps her gun in this position, locked onto her sister, and the two of them begin to make their way across the rooftop. Johanna mocks her, jeering, telling her she has no idea what it means to be a real soldier, that the division is merely a small hindrance in their operations, and ultimately there is nothing they can do to stop the cleaners from completing what needs to be done. Then, without warning, Johanna manages to disarm her sister, and after a brief tussle, manoeuvres her into a chokehold, and Hoskins blacks out. Eventually Hoskins comes to, her weapons are gone. It's quiet, deafeningly quiet, and she starts to realise that everyone is gone. Calling over the comms for Shu, 
she gets no response. Getting carefully to her feet, she feels weak and disoriented. She starts to make her way down from the roof. Continuing to call out over the radio, she begins to get more and more concerned, and anxiously she starts to call out. It definitely looks like the cleaners are long gone. Entering the warehouse, she hears a voice. Buried under some rubble is a heavily injured cleaner who has been left behind by his crew. He's in pretty bad shape, burns over most of his body, and he's unlikely to last long. Hoskins rushes over to the man and screams at him, demanding to know where the other agent is and what they have done with him. Although clearly in pain, the man laughs mockingly at her, and her chest begins to tighten in horror. Suddenly, Isaac blips, indicating there is an echo nearby. Hoskins feels herself break out into a cold sweat. She knows she has to. She doesn't want to, but she has no choice. She must find out the truth. Activating the echo, she observes as Isaac begins to piece together the events of Agent Shu's whereabouts. The echo identifies a heated exchange of words between Johanna and Shu, which quickly turns violent and her sister starts to fire a gun upon him. Crying out in pain, as a bullet penetrates his flesh, he tries to reason with the woman. But she is unremorseful, and once again fires another bullet into his body. Writhing in pain, he begins to beg her for mercy, but she isn't done yet. Coldly, she grabs a flamethrower from one of the others, and without hesitation, lights him on fire. Hoskins stands rooted to the spot, mortified and unable to escape the screams of agony coming through her earpiece, as Shu's final agonizing moments of life are forever imprinted into her head. Turning back to the wounded cleaner on the ground, she shrieks at him to tell him immediately where the others have gone. He is reluctant at first, but quickly changes his mind after Hoskins provides a bit of persuasion by inflicting painful pressure on his injuries. Gasping, he confesses they are heading towards the Empire Autumn Hotel. He also divulges information around what the cleaners are planning to do with all of those firebombs, that the Hudson refugee camp is their target. At this time, Hoskins' radio suddenly crackles, and Amsel could be heard over the comms, declaring that her and the JTF are on their way. Hoskins, still reeling from anger, informs her that the site is now secure, but Shu is dead. Johanna heads through the sewers with the remaining cleaners. They eventually emerge back up to the surface. Xanders is there with a squad of LMB, weapons, ammunition, and some defences ready to be deployed. Johanna questions if he is there to help. He responds yes, but is obviously uncomfortable with the situation. Not long after, a report from an LMB scout alerts him to a large group of JTF approaching the current location. Johanna is prepared to take a stand and fight them, but the plan is to load the bombs onto the subway car and get it moving as quickly as possible towards the Hudson refugee camp. Once it's on its way, there is nothing the JTF or the division agents can do to stop it. All she needs from the LMB is for them to hold off the approaching JTF as long as possible while they get the explosives into the car. Xanders has an uneasy feeling with the plan but nonetheless, he orders his men to take positions around the hotel courtyard. The approaching forces are now only four blocks away. As they head towards the compound, the agents manage to gun down an LMB scout. Shot in the leg, he has no way to escape them, and through a bit of persuasive pressure, he eventually reveals that the LMB are working alongside the cleaners and helping a lady called Johanna. Immediately, Amsel confiscates his radio before ordering some JTF officers to remove the man and get him some medical aid. Contacting Xanders via radio, she challenges him. Does he really know who he's working with? Johanna, his so-called ally, has already slaughtered two division agents. The JTF continue to move forward with their assault on the compound. Inside the hotel, a clearly agitated Xanders tries to interrogate Johanna probing her for information on what happened with the agents she had encountered earlier. He demands to know what her plan is, and does she even realise that by fighting the JTF, which is made up of police and military personnel, that they are essentially killing their own. 
His questions remain unanswered as time is quickly moving and he is needed outside in order to help his men with coordinating the defence. Frustrated with Xander's incompetence and seeing what truly matters and why these sacrifices are necessary, Johanna instructs one of her cleaners to prepare a collection of some of the leftover firebombs and place them directly underneath the courtyard. The man is confused and states that the majority of the LMB are in the courtyard and if by some chance the bombs were to go off, they would all be wiped out. Sharply she snaps back at him to just get it done. The cleaners have nearly finished loading the bombs onto the subway car. All they need now from the LMB is to buy them just a little more time. Suddenly the gunfire from the JTF ceases and they can be seen hunkering down outside the compound and holding their position. Xander suspects the agents are up to something, and he's right. Far beneath the compound, the agents are finding another way in. The agents have come to realise that whenever the cleaners abandon a location, that they do so by utilising the sewers. So surely now, and especially given the current circumstances, they yet again will be doing the same. Hoskins sends out a pulse wave, which identifies the JTF above them and the LMB in the courtyard and within the hotel. However, it alarmingly also detects a number of explosives that have been set underground just ahead of them, and the man that has set them up is still down here. On top of this, the pulse also reveals that a few of the cleaners are sneaking up behind the JTF. As the agents begin to piece everything together, they come to the realisation that by applying pressure to the back of the JTF, the cleaners will undoubtedly push them forward and into the courtyard. Once inside, they will be trapped, and the bombs will be detonated, killing everyone within the compound including the LMB. Frantically, they start trying to radio through to the JTF, but the signal is blocked. Their only chance to disable the bombs before the cleaners have a chance to set them off. Quickly, they start moving towards the explosive devices, but the cleaner who was setting them up has spotted them. He attempts to radio through to the rest of the crew, but he also isn't getting a signal. The agents continue to move forward. They must disable the bombs as fast as possible but also vital, they must stop the cleaner from getting back and alerting the others. Amsel goes after the cleaner, while Hoskins agrees to get to work on the bombs, as she has some experience with disarming these types of explosives. But it's pitch black down there, and Hoskins is struggling to find the location of the devices. Her pulse still needs to charge, and the cleaner is getting away. Eventually, she manages to locate three of the four bombs, and disarm them. At Amsel's suggestion, she also takes the triggers away, so they can't be rearmed by the cleaners later. However, the fourth bomb is a little different, and Hoskins is unsure of how to tackle this one. Yet, given they are running out of time, she has to make a call, and decides to pull what she guesses is most likely the correct wire. Unfortunately, this causes the device to go off, although thankfully it doesn't explode. But the agents quickly realise that the area around them is quickly filling with gas. Due to lack of air circulation within the sewers, they are forced to immediately find a way to the surface, before they pass out. They come across a ladder, knowing full well they could be about to expose themselves to the enemy, but despite this fact, they are dead if they remain down here. With agonising uncertainty, they quickly begin their fateful ascent up towards the surface. They find themselves coming up into the middle of the hotel courtyard, and immediately they are surrounded by LMB soldiers. Xanders emerges from out of the hotel to speak with the two agents. Amsel, this time to his face, questions him on what exactly he thinks he and his LMB are doing, and eventually they show him the triggers they pulled from the detonators. Xanders can't believe that the triggers are from bombs that are located directly below him and his men, that Jahana was planning on sacrificing the LMB. Then, without warning, bullets start raining down upon them. Jahana is mercilessly attacking them from above. While in his attempt to take cover, Xanders is struck by a bullet and although Hoskins attempts to save him, a major artery has been hit. As he bleeds out onto the pavement of the courtyard, his mind remains focused on his men, and he instructs his lieutenant to get them to safety. Whispering to him quietly, he says, They're yours now, Russo, before dying shortly after. Devastated by the senseless loss of his captain, the lieutenant is disgusted by Johanna's betrayal. Johanna, indifferent and without any remorse, instructs them to begin targeting the rest of the LMB. At the same time, the LMB lieutenant is declaring that all remaining cleaners need to be eliminated, every last one of them. 
Meanwhile, Hoskins and Amsel head down into the subway, following closely behind a rapidly departing Johanna. Ahead, they spot the subway car piled with explosives and realise it's slowly starting to move forward and in front of it is a cleaner who is blocking their way with a flamethrower. Amsel decides to take on the cleaner, allowing Hoskins to advance forward toward the subway car. She reaches the subway car just in time and quickly climbs aboard. It has started its journey towards its unsuspecting target. As she attempts to make contact with Amsel, she detects a loud bang reverberating through the subway. Then, over the radio, she hears the other agent's voice. Amsel is alive, but she's been hurt. It's all up to Hoskins now. Johanna is the last cleaner left, and she too is on the car. Once again, the sisters meet face to face. Pointing their guns at one another, Johanna remarks that even a single stray bullet would be all that is needed to set off the napalm tanks. She congratulates her sister. She truly has surprised her. She never would have expected this much from her in the past. Hoskins ignores these remarks and tries to instead reason with her sister, but it's a waste of time. Deep down, she knows her mind is too far gone. Johanna legitimately believes that this is the only way to save everyone, that by blowing up the people and their refugee camp, thousands of other lives will be saved. It's all come down to this, and she always knew it would. The one person who could get close enough to Johanna is the one person who would find it the hardest to pull the trigger and end it all. The lives of the refugees versus the life of her sister. A choice she never wanted to make. She fires a gun. The bullet tears through her sister's chest, knocking her backwards and onto the ground. Hoskins stares at her, mortified. What has she done? How could she do this? Her own sister. Johanna looks back at her in surprise. Why? she asks, not understanding how it really could have come to all of this. Hoskins cries she didn't have a choice. She couldn't let her do this, and that some things really are bigger than ourselves. Johanna tells her that it might be a good idea to pull the brake. Hoskins quickly runs too, and pulls back hard on the lever. The car wheels squeak and screech before eventually coming to a stop on the tracks. Returning to her sister, Johanna smiles up at her and remarks on what a good shot she is. Immediately, Hoskins drops to her knees and pleads to her sister to let her help her. Johanna brushes her off, stating that her bleeding is internal and there is nothing she can do for her. Hoskins calls over the radio, requesting immediate assistance to her location, refusing to give up. And together, for the first time in a long time, the sisters seem at peace with one another. I know I was always the better soldier, says Johanna, but you have always been the strong one. The division? They made the right choice. With her last breaths, she apologises, telling her that she loves her before dying shortly after. At the surface, Hoskins instructs a JTF officer to clear out and decommission the bombs in the subway, but to leave the body in the car untouched. Eventually Amsel shows up, though looking a little worse for wear. She explains that ever since she loaned Hoskins her phone that it's been going off non-stop. With that remark, she hands over the phone. Hoskins recognises the number. It was her husband who was calling. Quickly dialing the number back, she manages to reach her husband and lets him know that she is okay. She even has a chance to talk to her little boy. However, she ultimately has to tell them that her job isn't yet done, but she hopes to see them very soon. After returning the phone to Amsel, the agent tells her that she's proud of what she's been able to achieve over these past couple of weeks. And if she's ready, there is an agent on the other side of town who is in need of assistance. If she's up to it, she needs to get on her way now, but unfortunately Amsel won't be going with her. Instead, Hoskins will be taking along another agent who has yet to have any experience in the field. Someone who has been activated from out of town and brought into New York to help out. And it would be her job to bring him up to speed and teach him the ins and outs of what's been happening in New York City. As I mentioned in the first video of this series, this has just been my narrative point of view of the Hearts on Fire audiobook. I strongly urge you to check it out on audible.com. Casey Wayland, Katie Sackhoff, Shannon Woodward and the rest of the cast have done an amazing job on this, and have really only just summed up what is a fantastic Division story. From here I'm likely to drill down a little closer into the detail they've given us, and potentially overanalyze the extra information we've been provided throughout the story. 
there have been a few insights that have potentially spoken a little more around what was available to the first wave agents, and perhaps a few flaws in what we've learnt about the SHD over the last few, well, many years that the Division franchise has been around. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed listening to the story as much as I did, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers! Cheers!